I'm Jared Gardner and I'm an assistant professor of pathology and dermatology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. And uh, I'm here with Dr. Omar Sangueza, who is a professor of pathology and dermatology and the director of the Dermatopathology program at Wake Forest. Uh, Omar, uh, welcome and thanks for having an interview with us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. So today I'd like to talk about vascular tumors. I know that you have a, an interest in that area. I you know, had a great talk on that this morning. What got you interested in vascular lesions? Uh, it's interesting. You know, I, there's a long story. When I was a fellow, I met this uh, doctor from Spain. His name is Luis Requena. And Luis Requena is probably one of the most prolific uh, dermatologists in the world. He has like a thousand papers, doesn't he, or something? Many more. I mean, <laughs> he has uh, several books. You know, you, he has a book in soft tissue tumors. And uh, we started to work on this project on vascular tumors many years ago. And first we wrote a CME article for the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, the JAD. So based on that, we decided to expand that project and we decided to write the book. He moved uh, forward and he uh, decided to complete the whole project and he's written a book in soft tissue neoplasms now that uh, I think is being well received and you know, there's, uh, it's selling really well. It's a wow. really good book, yeah. So early exposure to a mentor made a difference, I guess, in yeah. your life. Yeah, we were more than a mentor. He was friends because it's a very, it's very interesting the way that we inter, inter, I interacted with him because we lived to, we lived together uh, in in New York for a while for three months because um, uh, and every every day we basically we had something new to write. You know, because <laughs> he just he just very very prolific and you know he he basically forced me to work with him. And so we had <laughs> lots and lots of uh, papers. And many of them, you know, we, were, we did a paper on neural tumors that uh, was a review in the, we published in the American Journal of Dermatopathology. I think there were two separate uh, components. One was for benign tumors and the other one for malignants. So the next one was to do, or, or it was to do vascular tumors. So we, we split the, the work and, you know, he did part and I did part. Uh, we, we still continue working. Now we are working in a book on that next cell neoplasms. Ho hopefully it'll be, it'll be ready by the end of the year. The wow. publishers are pu uh, pushing us to finish the, the work. And so we, we're always doing something. So uh, partners in crime over your whole career, right? That's basically it. Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, well, over that time, what changes have you seen in our understanding of vascular lesions? What, what particularly stands out to you as something that really is kind of amazing from where we were when you started out to where we are now? It's very, that's a very good question because there are several things, but one of the things that changed the most, I think, is this issue about Kaposi sarcoma. When I was in New York, uh, we were right at the time when the numbers of Kaposi sarcoma were incredibly high. We, Dr. Ackerman, who was our mentor, our professor, he was, um, he basically was one of the persons who called attention to this, uh, the growing number of uh, uh, cases of Kaposi sarcoma. And he thought at that point that Kaposi sarcoma was induced by a virus. Wow. And nobody took him seriously because he couldn't prove because just his, all his observation, observations were based on hematoxylin and eosin stain slides. So uh, uh, after that, you know, the number of capri sarcomas uh, started to decrease, and we, ha we see a few cases here and there. Sure. But uh, I think that uh, that was the first thing that happened. The second thing, uh, every, there were a large number of vascular tumors that they were described but based on com comparing those vascular tumors to Kaposi sarcoma because everybody was worried that they were going to miss a Kaposi uh -huh. sarcoma. So you have the descriptions of targetoid hemosiderotic hemangioma, that today is called Hopnail hemangioma, mm -hmm. microbinular hemangiomas, and other types of... All the mimics. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and you know, one of the... Uh, a, a contributors for that was also the, uh, Danny Santa Cruz. He described some of those entities. So uh, that's what happened. And so it was an explosion in the number of, of uh, vascular tumors because before it was just hemangiomas uh -huh. or angiosarcomas, and that was the end of it. Some people will make diagnosis of capri sarcomas in older people, Mediterranean origin or Jewish, but that was, that was it. So, um, but now we have a large number of entities that, you know, they are. They, they are very specific and we can, make a we can make a diagnosis. 
The other thing that we've seen a major change in the number of um, markers. We have a new, uh, several new markers. We have, you know, podo planning. We have the ERGs and things like that. They are very specific and really good for vascular proliferations. And HHV8, this uh, the oh. virus. Amazing, it, yeah. It's amazing and it's very specific for capus sarcoma. So all these changes have developed in the last few years. That's amazing. Yeah, I guess I never thought about that, that kind of why that proliferation happened. You know, coming into, you know, dermatopathology and soft tissue pathology just a short time ago myself, you know, five or six years ago, I guess, um, I never thought about that, that the HIV epidemic and Kaposi C sarcoma is what drove all of the description of all of the possible mimics. That's really amazing. I never thought about it that way. Well, I think that's what, that's what happened. It makes because, sense. You know, it makes, uh, also, the other thing, you know, uh, that was very interesting a few years ago, the Mulligans and his group, they started to work on the... Um, um, infantile hemangiomas and they, they, they separate it, they have different groups and it's very important for therapeutic considerations, behavioral considerations and the prognosis because you know infantile hemangiomas usually affect uh, children and the yeah. parents are really worried about those those things. Yeah exactly, yeah, my daughter actually has one but hers has done the normal pattern of evolution, it's small and been okay but you know when you like the picture you showed today when it involves half of a poor baby's face that's a serious, a serious thing you know that everyone one's worried about. So um, the other question I wanted to ask was uh, about angiosarcoma. So I see a lot of angiosarcomas and I, obviously a lot of the ones I see are post-radiation and I actually work with a patient support group on Facebook. Um, it has about over 2,000 angiosarcoma patients in it which has been really um, very amazing kind of life-changing experience to see from their perspective what they go through. And so many of them go through um, misdiagnosis for a long time both clinically and some of them pathologically. So uh, one question I have is, how often do you see cases that have, of angiosarcoma that were initially misdiagnosed pathologically? Several times I've seen cases of angiosarcoma that being missed by something else. I remember a case of a, it was read as a cellulitis years ago because oh. it was a, very inflamed. Actually, uh, and they are not easy to diagnose because I'm not blaming anybody. No, no, because, you know, of course. It's, it's, are, it's hard. It's very hard, especially. Especially in, as inflamed ones. Those yeah, are and, subtle. And, and, oh, in the early stages. I took that case to a conference in Miami years ago, who was a challenge to the experts. So I took that case, and everybody who was in the panel and were supposed to be experts, they all missed the diagnosis. You know, I, so how a, a general pathologist is going to make a diagnosis is it's very hard. And it happens. Sometimes we get in a, a not very good biopsies. The size of the biopsy is, is small. Sure. It's not it's sufficient to make a diagnosis. And you get just a few vessels. And in retrospect, you know, three months later, the patient shows up with a bright pink lesion on the face or somewhere else. And it, it's then easy to miss th those, those cases. And it happens more often than you, you may think, that many cases that they are, they are missed. Because sure. The biopsies are superficial or they're, they're not, there's not enough a material there in order to make the diagnosis. So when I see large excision specimens of angiosarcoma, I like to go out to the edge and find those little subtle channels that right. infiltrate and then show the resident that and be like, what's this, is this okay? No, look at the over here where it's high grade. Clearly it's angiosarc when you see it all in right. continuity, right. but it's terrifying to think of a small biopsy of that area. Um, the other thing that, you know, that I, so I actually asked the patient group, I told them I was going to do this interview, and I said, what do you guys want me to ask an angiosarcoma expert? So the patients came up with this enormous list of great questions. Um, but another one that they brought up was, you know, many of the ones who have post-radiation angiosarc, they said, we weren't really told that there was some risk of angiosarcoma from radiation, which I understand because it's rare, but I feel like maybe we're not, you know, outside of pathology, maybe we're not overall doing as well as we could with educating patients that they should be watching their radiation site. I don't feel like the dermatologists necessarily even know to check when I speak on vascular tumors to derm groups. Do you, do your dermatologists, do you know, uh, is there a great, you know, so many people have radiation, but I don't feel like it's routinely checked, you know, the radiation site. It's not. And the other, the other problem is that most of these patients that they have these kind of complications, they don't, they do not go to a dermatologist. They go to a, a surgeon. A surgeon and breast, and, yeah. And many of the surgeons, they, they don't have these skills and, uh, well, they know what to do, but they are not aware of these, these, these complications mm -hmm. and many times, you know, they, they, they just don't, they don't tell the patients so, or they don't make a good clinical examination or whatever and, you know, they, 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 they don't diagnose those things early enough. Do you feel like early diagnosis 
relates to better outcome. I was always kind of taught we don't know that, but I thought it, it can't hurt to diagnose earlier. But I think it does, especially in the, in the post radiation angiosarcomas, because many of those cases start small papules, they're small lesions, and if you excise those things completely, I think those patients are doing, going to do really, really well. Now, if it's, that's not the, the case sometimes with angiosarcomas on uh, sun exposed, the yeah. Wilson, Wilson Jones angiosarcomas. Those angiosarcomas, usually they, t they have to have a very, very poor outcome. So it's important, I think, all this, even, uh, even more in the low grade uh, angiosarcomas, the so-called hemangioendoteliomas, those, those lesions, if you diagnose this early enough, Usually, there's zero complications. Right. So that's that's really interesting. And so you bring up grade. And so aside from obviously hemangioendothelium is this kind of intermediate gray zone group. But for angiosarcoma, do you actually grade angiosar into low or high grade? I was always taught to not grade, no. but I've I've been asked questions by that by patients or by other people. Should we grade this? And I thought I always think of it as high grade, even the well so-called well differentiated. I do you notice any difference in grade or do anything? No, like that? I don't think grade makes a big difference. Once an, uh, you make a diagnosis of angiosarcoma. It is. Uh, it's just a matter of time before it's going right. to evolve into high. It's going to be very yeah aggressive. Yeah, histologically. That's how I've approached it in my practice as well, and I haven't. I haven't noticed to do anything different than that. Um, the other thing I've, I found really interesting, and just within the past what, maybe five years, is we went from having maybe aside from HHV8, not really any great test to tell us other than saying this is endothelial derived. We didn't have anything great to tell us this is malignant or benign, but now HHV8 helps us to know this is capacity. And then within the past five years with MIC and the discovery of MIC amplification and how that's, you know, can be used as an actual diagnostic tool, and, and then now there are new tests that we're finding with WWTR1, CAM to one, all these molecular findings in vascular tumors. What do you see, you know, 10 years or so into the future, where do you see molecular pathology impacting vascular lesions as we go forward? I think like in, a, in any soft tissue tumor, it's going to have a big impact because, you know, you know very well because you do a lot of uh, soft tissue tumors in your practice, but, you know, many of the soft tissue neoplasms now are basically on genetic testing, you know, translocations, and I think that's what we're starting to find in vascular tumors. And that's going to be, I think that's going to make a big, big impact. Somebody was asking this morning about these this, uh, alterations, genetic alterations that they found in vascular malformations. And that, that's, that's going to come. And, you know, basically that's it's going to be a day where I think everything, everything is going to be based in, on the H and E, but the confirmation is going to be done by molecular testing. Well, it seems like every month in the literature, there's some new thing. Like you know, dermatofibromas have a translocation now. Right. Steve Billings told us this morning. I thought I didn't know that. I'm supposed to know about this stuff, so right. it just it's hard to keep up with all of it. Um, the last question, I guess, I would have is. What major questions do you still see that need to be answered about vascular lesions? What, what are the major research questions that, that we really need to solve and sort out? I think we need to start to uh, have better means in order to uh, make more specific diagnosis. And I'm going to give you an example. Uh, there are many lesions that they, 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 they look like tufted angiomas, but they are yeah. not tufted angiomas. Because if you make a diagnosis of tufted angiomas, if tufted angioma, you are making a serious diagnosis because, you know, needs usually radical surgery because some of these patients, they are going to develop the Casabat merit syndrome. So it's important to make this diagnosis. But on, the, on a day-to-day -day basis, you see many tumors that they look, they have the morphology. A little of, bit of the cannonball, you know, yeah. Are all those tufted angiomas? No. I think it's important. I think that's where I see a major impact if there's something, some markers or molecular tests that they can help us in order to make a specific diagnosis for all these lesions that they look very similar. The same things with glomeruloid hemangiomas. Oh, yeah. yeah pyogenic granulomas can have a glomeruloid arrangement. Absolutely. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that the patient has Kasselman's disease or POM syndrome. It's, you know, may just be an incidental finding. So I think that's where uh, uh, we, we still need to develop some uh, uh, tools in order to be able to make very specific diagnosis in those cases and not to confuse, so, you know, not to mislabel or not mi to misdiagnose many of the vascular tumors. Fantastic. Omar, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. A thank pleasure. you for having me this afternoon. Of course. Okay.